Hello, my name is Craig Stranger, and I'm the Vice President of Development here at MGFA. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ali Habib. Dr. Habib is a board certified neurologist who specializes in neuromuscular disorders, including myasthenia gravis at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Habib will be speaking today on navigating a seronegative diagnosis. Let's welcome Dr. Habib. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for listening in, for diving in. I believe I stand between you and a period of rest uh, to digest all the really awesome information that has been presented uh, by excellent presenters prior to me. So I am going to talk uh, about seronegative myasthenia and how we got to this uh, condition, what it means for those of you out there. Um, and um, I always uh, start most of my presentations with somewhat of a historical uh, background to help us understand where we are uh, current in the current state. And what you see right here in the opening slide is a picture of Chief, Chief Opechano Kanu, uh, who is believed to have been the first described case of myasthenia in the US uh, dating to the mid 1600s. Um, and I have, uh, uh, through the course of my time, uh, had support in various ways uh, from different companies that we work with on the clinical trial side, as well as helping them uh, with uh, uh, bringing new therapies to uh, the forefront. Um, just an overview of uh, what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'll start with the historical aspects of how we got to what is known as seronegative myasthenia gravis. How do we go about making the diagnosis of myasthenia in general and then seronegative myasthenia? What has been the landscape uh, over the decades in terms of treatment options, uh, particularly related to seronegative myasthenia gravis uh, with some view into changes that have come about in the last five years or so? And some parting thoughts, uh, and then we will bring on some questions that all of you have very proactively uh, sent well well ahead of time. So that really helps in cutting down my time talking and really getting to what all of you want to know about seronegative myasthenia gravis. So um, just starting off with the whole story of myasthenia gravis with a particular interest uh, and focus on the antibody part of myasthenia gravis. So back in the 1970s uh, was when we first got to know about antibody presence in myasthenia gravis, meaning specifically the identification of antibodies directed against the acetylcholine receptor. Dr. Appel and his group were the first ones to identify an antibody directed against the receptor. And very shortly thereafter was a large case series by Dr. Lindstrom uh, and Dr. Lennon, uh, their group talking about patients with and without the antibody. And what Dr. Appel's group noted was that they had at least five out of 15, possibly 11 out of 15 patients where an antibody directed against the receptor was identified. And Dr. Lindstrom's group further uh, found similar numbers in terms of percentage so about 87% of patients had the antibody against myasthenia gravis, uh, against the acetylcholine receptor amongst patients who had myasthenia gravis. And this was the beginning of what is now known as seropositive and seronegative myasthenia gravis. So historically, seropositive myasthenia meant that you had antibodies directed against the acetylcholine receptor, whereas seronegative myasthenia were patients who did not have these antibodies detectable in their serum. If we jump ahead a few decades to the beginning of the century, a new uh, antibody got identified by Angela Vincent uh, and her group uh, in Oxford. And this led to a second subgroup of patients, much smaller than the group that has acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And so, the term seronegative now got updated to really mean double seronegative, meaning you do not have antibodies 
to the acetylcholine receptor or to the musk receptor. Uh, and it, just another line over here that I'll mention, and we'll get back to this in subsequent slides regarding treatment. Musk antibodies, even as early as that first description, were known to be of a different subclass than the ones that were directed against the acetylcholine receptor. Um, and when comparing um, the clinical uh, type uh, in musk myasthenia, there were some differences noted in that um, there were more, uh, there was more involvement of what we refer to as bulbar muscles. So the muscles of the mouth and face being affected more so than the arms and legs when comparing to uh, patients with the, um, without the musk antibody. Um, fast forward a few years again, and in 2011 and subsequently 2012, there were sub several publications that talked about the identification of a third uh, antibody subtype now known as the anti-LRP4 antibody. And this was found to be present in a small proportion of patients who had um, did not have the acetylcholine receptor antibody. Um, and there was a complete um, different overlap. There was, uh, sorry, there was no overlap uh, between the patients who had LRP4 antibody or, and those who did not. Uh, whereas some of the patients who had um, musk antibody also had LRP4 antibody uh, in that series. Um, so as things stand at this point, uh, when we use the term seronegative, it really refers to not having any of those antibodies. It still is a bit confusing because some purists will refer to seronegative as referring to only the absence of acetylcholine receptors, whereas others will use it in the triple seronegative uh, sense, meaning you do not have antibodies to all three uh, molecules. So how do we go about making the diagnosis of myasthenia? Um, a lot of what we do now still stands from way before these antibodies were uh, found. So the first and foremost, the most important aspect of any diagnosis in medicine with myasthenia or otherwise is looking at the clinical picture. How does the symptoms that are described and the evolution of those symptoms fit a particular diagnosis. And what I find often is that pa uh, patients uh, have reported symptoms to their providers in um, general terms, and the providers don't dig too much into those symptoms and take them at face value and come about making the or considering the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Um, the other thing that is now very easy to obtain is doing the antibody testing and getting acetylcholine receptor antibody testing commercially is very, very easy. Um, most labs uh, at a small scale or commercial national labs perform this testing. Um, and the electrophysiological testing still has an important role in making the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. So performing what I'm sure all of you are familiar with, the repetitive nerve stimulation testing is uh, common for a majority of patients and they've undergone this testing. And in some instances, uh, we go on to perform the single fiber EMG. The single fiber EMG is, um, I mean, both of these tests are fairly technically rigorous. So they do require a lot of attention to detail, especially the single fiber electromyography. Uh, and there are not very many centers um, nationally that do uh, this, though in any large metropolitan area, you will have uh, at least a few providers who will perform this test um, for patients. Um, once we've considered the diagnosis of myasthenia, response to treatment has been another important aspect of confirming that diagnosis. So back in the day, and this is uh, even before my time, the Tensilon test was commonly done. 
it really isn't done uh, very much anymore. So patients who had diagnosed uh, myasthenia with Tensilon test probably had their diagnosis many years ago. But uh, response to peridostigmine, mestinon is certainly uh, another clue uh, to the validity of the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Um, and then uh, also looking at treatment response to the disease modifying therapies. So amongst those, you have the fast acting therapies uh, or like IVIG and plasmapheresis, which we uh, want, we think work within a few, uh, as early as a few days to within a few weeks, excuse me, and longer term uh, treatment response uh, with steroids uh, and immunosuppressive therapy. So it's not any one of these factors that leads us to the diagnosis. Uh, it's a combination of all of these uh, things lining up. So having a clinical suspicion, the right clinical suspicion for myasthenia gravis, really digging into the history and finding the characteristic pattern, particularly about fatigability of muscle strength. Um, and the areas that get affected in the body um, sub with support from antibody testing, electrophysiologic testing, and the response to treatment, put all of those together to make the diagnosis. So sometimes making the diagnosis of myasthenia and uh, make, finding uh, mimics of myasthenia or other conditions that may look like myasthenia uh, but are not myasthenia is very easy. And at other times it is not. Um, I'm gonna give you two examples of this here. So here we have a patient who was seen, uh, so the 61 year old man who had complaints of uh, drooping of eyelids starting in late uh, 2021. Um, the patient himself described the drooping of the eyes more as a heaviness of the eyes requiring more effort to keep the eyes open, giving a sense of tension in the forehead. As would one would want to hear and expect, uh, the symptoms fluctuate during the day, which is uh, one of the hallmark features of myasthenia, and was first seen by a neuro-ophthalmologist who noted fatigable weakness of the eyelid muscles so that the eyes progressively close as the patient's looking straight or up. Um, he was given a trial of mestinon and noted some improvement in his eye symptoms, um, but did not endorse having any double vision or any problems in any of the other areas uh, of the body. Um, on exam, when he was seen um, by a neurology, uh, he was noted to have again fatigable eyelid drooping, some double vision when looking up for a period of time, but no other problems elsewhere, and was actually seen by a very seasoned clinician who noted that there is no doubt that the patient has immune myasthenia gravis. Obviously, that led to further testing to confirm the diagnosis, and that included repetitive stimulation testing, as well as a single fiber EMG, both of which were normal uh, antibody testing through two different labs was negative and musk antibody was also negative. So at a subsequent visit, um, um, the patient was seen again and it, this was a, interestingly a visit via Zoom because of the surge in COVID numbers. And it was noted that it wasn't really much of a drooping that the patient was describing it was more that the eyes tended to just close on the person. You would say, well, what's the real difference? It's actually difficult for me to explain that either, um, but such was what was noted. Um, and we, uh, the, because this was a Zoom visit, it actually enabled doing a recording um, of the patient's symptoms. And this recording was uh, discussed with some of our other neurology colleagues that led to a very quick and easy alternate diagnosis uh, for this patient, um, completely moving away from the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. So this was a very easy pickup. Um, moving on to when things don't go quite so nicely, um, this is uh, another patient that was seen in our practice. Uh, so she was 69 year old 
uh, who was referred because of re uh, refractory myasthenia and insurance not approving a specific therapy for the myasthenia. Um, and her story goes that she developed problems with swallowing in the late 50s. And this swallowing problem was a progressive problem. So again, like I mentioned before, uh, the devil is in the detail. So as opposed to this swallowing problem being uh, come and go fluctuating type of thing, this was more uh, described as a very slowly progressive problem. Uh, a decade or so later, developed some drooping of the eyes and double vision. Again, this was progressive from the get-go um, and also developed problems with arm and leg weakness and some breathing problems. Um, uh, the suspicion was for myasthenia gravis and uh, went down the road of uh, different medications being tried, including peridostigmine with some benefit. Um, this was as reported by the patient, uh, given high doses of prednisone, uh, which subsequently were tapered down to a moderate dose. Again, some benefit noted. Other therapies tried, including IVIG and Solaris, echelizumab. Uh, with no benefit noted. And again, last therapy tried was plasmapheresis with some benefit noted. This is as reported by the patient. At the time that uh, she came for her first visit at UCI, uh, her eyelid weakness was so severe, she was not able to open her eyes and actually had to open them with her eyes. With mild limitation of her right eye moving out, and fairly significant weakness in the upper and lower extremities. Uh, what was also easy to see was the long-term use of steroids, uh, having that their toll on uh, in terms of side effects uh, of um, for the patient. We did a repetitive nerve stimulation testing, and that was normal. Uh, the cause of a high suspicion for another condition, uh, we did genetic testing and that gave us the answer to a completely different diagnosis that uh, is not an immune disorder, it is a genetic in, uh, disease. And this, by the time that we got to this diagnosis, it had been 12 years since her symptoms had started and she had been on multiple medications. So. This highlights how challenging a diagnosis it can be to, uh, to make as well as to undo or avoid uh, making the diagnosis of seronegative myasthenia gravis. I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about the treatment options that are available in myasthenia in general and how it relates to seronegative myasthenia gravis. And uh, even, uh, quite some time ago, Dr. Vincent uh, had uh, made this thing that uh, had written this really nice uh, review on um, seronegative myasthenia gravis. And in that noted that just because it is seronegative, it does not mean that patients uh, do not have antibodies or an immune basis uh, to, the cyst, uh, to the underlying disease. Of course, subsequently uh, being proven correct uh, with the discovery of the musk and LRP4 antibodies. And um, the for the longest time up until 2016, um, the therapies that were used for myasthenia gravis with antibody is what was used for seronegative myasthenia gravis as well with the one exception of thymectomy where the role of thymectomy in seronegative myasthenia gravis was not so clear, especially if um, there was absence of a thymoma. Um, and so that was not a therapy that was considered as readily as it was in patients who have acetylcholine receptor antibody. Um, well, what changed after 2016? So, um, the advent of echelizumab um, made significant changes in the way we think about the treatment of myasthenia gravis because as you uh, may recall i had mentioned that the antibodies uh, against the mask are of a different subtype compared to the acetylcholine receptor antibody and this goes to the mechanism 
by which echelizumab works. So it blocks the activity of proteins in the serum called complement. And these are implicated in damaging the nerve muscle junction in acetylcholine receptor antibody subtypes. Mm -hmm. um, because the IgG1 and 3, which are listed here, are the subtypes of antibodies that activate or promote the activity of complement, whereas IgG4 antibodies do not activate complement. So there is a clear dichotomy here that you would not uh, consider the use of medications that block complement action in patients who have IgG4 antibodies. Well, what, in, what happens in patients where we don't know what antibody they have, so the double negative patients? It's difficult to say whether you would or would not um, treat these patients with medications that block complement. So it certainly has had uh, an impact on how we think about any uh, therapies and what to consider and not. On the flip side of that, the most recent approval of the first in-class medication that acts by blocking FCRN, uh, which is an internal recycling mechanism uh, for IgG antibodies. This mechanism is not selective in terms of the action on any of the IgG subtypes. So in principle, um, this would or could potentially be beneficial in removing all types of antibodies in myasthenia, assuming that they are of the IgG subtype. Of course, in seronegative patients, we don't know what subtype it is, so we can't say. Um, irrespective, as things stand right now, the, in the approval of this medication is specifically for acetylcholine receptor positive generalized myasthenia gravis. Um, the one thing that is also a, a big plus in recent years is that the pivotal study for uh, FGAR uh, the first in class approved drug, uh, included patients with seronegative myasthenia gravis, which previously had uh, not happened. So I, I, I think, and, and uh, lots of folks in the community uh, are excited that patients with seronegative myasthenia gravis are being recognized as still having very significant disease and uh, needing to be uh, part of the movement in finding better therapies for seronegative, uh, for myasthenia gravis. Um, just a few uh, parting thoughts here. As I've tried to illustrate very, very uh, quickly, uh, Making the diagnosis of seronegative myasthenia gravis is not easy. It can be very challenging. And at least in my practice, I'm always questioning that diagnosis, always leaving the door open to consider other possibilities that might explain the symptoms that patients are having, especially in the setting of a lack of response to treatment um, from therapies that traditionally we know work really well in all forms of myasthenia gravis. Um, uh, and, and it really is, it should be okay to reconsider the diagnosis, uh, especially on the part of clinicians, um, to keep, that, keep an open mind about the possibility of other potential explanations and to be open to having um, a, a fresh look via second opinions uh, for patients who don't uh, respond to therapy. Um, why is this important? Because other diseases may have options for treatment that are different than the ones we use for myasthenia gravis. At the very least, it would hopefully avoid unnecessary exposure to uh, therapies that we use in myasthenia because if a therapy is, has no potential for benefit and it only carries the potential for harm in terms of side effects. And in some cases, um, especially when it comes to inherited disorders, there can be a benefit to family members having your patient di getting diagnosed with a different disorder 
uh, in terms of what the outlook for them might be and other treatment options. Um, last but not least, I, uh, I am sure everybody here is very familiar with the MGFA website. And on this, um, a very uh, nice resource page they have is for patients um, who are newly diagnosed. And if you click on that tab, there is a, an, uh, a link for a page talking about partners in care. Uh, these are clinicians uh, who are experienced in myasthenia uh, and work with the MGFA. So feel uh, free to look up the, the list uh, if there is any time you want to have another opinion or another set of eyes uh, take a look at you. Um, I am sure you'll be able to find people in and nearby um, the areas that you're in. Um, that I believe is my last slide. So um, I am happy to take questions. And as I'd mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, folks had been really, really proactive and sent a nice long list uh, ahead of time. So. I'm going to go through some of these questions that came in as well as there are questions coming in the a lot of questions coming in the chat and I have no idea to help guide me through those. Um, I'm going to start like with me to help uh, you. I'm here to help you. Go for it. I'm here to help you. Okay, so let me ask one that came in the chat and then we'll go on to the other ones. Is seronegative MG the same as anti-musk MG? It is not. Um, Anti-musk MG um, is specifically when um, you have the antibody identified. And it's actually very important to identify the anti-musk antibody because from what we know so far, it, it really behaves uh, differently than acetylcholine receptor antibody myasthenia. Um, there are implications in terms of response to therapy in musk myasthenia versus acetylcholine receptor myasthenia. From what we know, um, there isn't really a role of thymectomy in musk myasthenia. There is a clear role for thymectomy in specific folks with acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia. So there are quite a few differences. So I would not say that anybody who doesn't have uh, acetylcholine receptor antibody is um, automatically musk myasthenia. Sorry, that's a long-winded answer, but hopefully it gets to the point. Okay. The next question is, should individuals that tested negative for musk and ACHR be tested for LRP4 as well? If so, where can they get tested for LRP4? I think it's very, very reasonable to get testing for LRP4. In our practice, we send the testing to Athena Diagnostics Lab. Their website is athenadiagnostics.com. Um, and, and they have a seronegative panel, which tests for both the musk and LRP4. You can also do LRP4 testing separately. So that is something that's commercially available and can get done. Okay. What if only one part of the ACHR panel is positive, binding, blocking, or modulating, but the rest are negative? This is actually a very interesting question. Um, for the longest time, we used to do all three antibodies. Uh, I think um, we've some of uh, the practices have moved away from this because of specific reasons. So the binding antibody is the most specific and the more sens most sensitive antibody. What do those words mean? Uh, it means that the probability that you will pick up myasthenia gravis when myasthenia is, gravis is present is highest with when testing the binding antibody. And conversely, when the binding antibody is positive, you probably have myasthenia gravis. The blocking antibody is, um, it, it does, it, is positive very rarely in people who do not have the acetyl the binding antibody. So most patients in whom blocking antibody is positive also will have a binding antibody. So it's, there's no major additive benefit from that. And the modulating antibody is interesting in the sense that there is a low but significant number of false positives 
uh, uh, in the modulating antibody, especially in older age groups. So I, I hope that answers that question. I, it, it, point, but I think if, let me also say here that the antibody testing alone does not make or break the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Um, you really have to look at the whole picture again, like I was saying before, the symptoms, the examination, the other testing, response to therapy, all of those put together make the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis, not any one particular aspect. Okay, thank you. Is MG still considered an autoimmune disorder for seronegative patients? Absolutely. Okay. Does using different labs make a difference in testing for antibodies? Um, different folks have different uh, feelings about this. Uh, our, the short answer is yes. Um, in our experience, some labs do a much better job at the antibody testing than other labs. Uh, we tend to rely on the Mayo Clinic uh, test. Uh, Athena Diagnostic is also a reliable lab. Um, again, if a test, if the antibody testing is positive in a patient who otherwise fits very well with the myasthenia diagnosis, there's no reason to repeat it at a different lab. Um, if I receive Ig products and test positive, are these my antibodies or someone else's? How long should I be off of IVIG before accurate testing of antibodies is able to be obtained? So the Ig the Antibodies that you get from uh, infusion, so IVIG, are extremely diluted. And there's, there is, ex in my mind, extremely low probability that if you test positive, that that is from somebody else because it, it's just an extremely diluted uh, sample that you get uh, if there was ever anybody who had donated blood and had myasthenia. So I think in my mind, if somebody tested positive, irrespective of IVIG therapy, that would be their antibodies. Do immune suppressing medications affect testing, including antibody testing and SFEMG and RNS? What about IVIG and PLEX? So I'm not sure I know the definitive answer about the antibody testing part. Um, Typically, when we do the testing is early on in the disease when people aren't on therapy. And once we've made a diagnosis, we usually don't serially follow through to see what happens to those antibody levels. Um, I, so in short, I don't want to answer to that. The single fiber EMG and repetitive nerve stimulation testing can certainly be altered by testing. And what that can mean is if, if your repetitive stimulation and single fiber EMG is normal, it can actually help uh, support uh, effective therapy. Um, the conclusion that therapy is being effective and we use it uh, in that sense. So we use single fiber EMG and repetitive nerve stimulation to show and to uh, make sure that there is a good treatment response. Uh, and the same thing would apply to IVIG and plasma exchange as well. Okay, the next question is, my neurologist has said that getting insurance to cover LRP4 antibody testing is extremely difficult and that it has little diagnostic value. Can you comment on this? Um, I've not had problems getting um, it approved, so I'm not sure. It, it may be differences in regions and specific insurances. I am, it is positive in a very small number of patients. Uh, I don't know if but in patients whom it is positive, it is helpful in securing that diagnosis. I, I'm not sure that I would say it's entirely uh, not helpful. Okay. Should we be retested if we are negative for ACHR and MUSK? If so, when and how often? So um, for the ACHR, um, I think if, Again, 
the it depends on where you got the initial testing that was negative my take would be if it was uh, a commercial lab you may want to consider getting it at a, um, at a different lab to confirm that it is there isn't a set frequency in with at which we te- retest acetylcholine receptor antibodies to s- check for quote unquote conversion uh, so zero conversion um, the musk myasthenia antibody uh, for sure we don't uh, read first of all there are very few labs that perform and uh, the testing so and we've not had a big issue with um, um, test results that don't um, jive with the clinical picture um, so I think it, musk antibody does not require repeat testing necessarily now that said that the musk antibody myasthenia does have a uh, uh, distinct phenotype in some patients so uh, if clinically it was suspected that somebody would have musk myasthenia and the testing was negative then i might consider repeating it at a different interval or a different lab okay we're going to take one last question what if the results of the lab shows some antibody present but it is below the number of the positive threshold isn't the presence of any antibody level abnormal? And why am I not considered positive for that? So that's a great question. And I think that has more to do with the methodology of testing. So it, um, there can be things like cross reactivity between uh, antibodies. Um, the way that labs make their cutoffs is dependent on sort of the point, the line where that is drawn between people who are normal and don't have antibodies and people who have a condition and have antibodies. So there can be uh, folks that fall on either side of that line and that's a valid point. Um, That said, the the antibody thresholds for the, the cutoff thresholds for especially the binding antibody is so low that I I don't think uh, you really have detectable antibodies that don't make the cutoff for being abnormal. Okay, thank you, Dr. Habib, for answering all of these questions. We might have a few more that we didn't get to, but we can try to answer them at a later date. So thank you very much for presenting today. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'm happy to, if you want, uh, you can forward those uh, to me and I'm happy to uh, respond to them um, via email or whichever. Thank Great. you so much. I hope everybody has Thank you. some useful information then. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed today's program. I always feel like I'm saying good morning to you, and before I know it, it's already the close of the day. Um, The first day of our conference was certainly filled with so much great information, and I cannot thank our speakers enough for sharing their expertise and their experiences. I also want to thank everyone else who helped pull off this program today. Certainly our industry partners, our sponsors who um, visited with our community members at their booths and shared lots of great information there as well and were resources. Thank you to the staff and volunteers for working behind the scenes to pull off this program, to work the chat rooms, and to talk to everybody. We will begin tomorrow's program at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And we certainly look forward to another day of great and robust programming. And the virtual platform will actually open one hour before the program begins. So if you want to come in and explore, we definitely invite you to do so. And tomorrow we also will be announcing the MGFA National Awards. So that will be a very meaningful, powerful part of our program. So again, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and have a great evening.